Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all worked for all the major publish- publishers in the business. Together, we've published somewhere around 75 children's books, and we've all taught illustration at university art schools. That is correct. Each week, we come at you guys with fantastic illustrator interviews or uh, listener questions just like you might have. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you learn something, brand spanking new. Yeah, and I want to follow up. We've been getting questions from people about self-publishing pro, so we just want to answer a few, few of those questions because uh, we, we have been mentioning that that's like our next big course that we're, we're currently like working on. And um, first off, um, just to just right out of the gate, it is the the enrollment for self publishing pro opens February twenty seventh, and it closes March fourth. So if this is something that you're you're interested in, write that down and 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 you're going to want to um, make sure you enroll at that time. But what what even is it? What kind of questions are we going to go over? Uh, what kind, or I guess what kind of questions have we been getting? And the first thing, the question that we get is, or, or I guess the concern people have is they're like, they, they're not even sure, they don't even know how to get started. They have this idea for a book that they want to do. They're not mm-hmm. sure it's, you know, they don't, they don't want to go the, the publishing route because maybe they want to have a little bit more control mm-hmm. over the idea. But um, the one of the first things is how do you, how do you get started? Mm -hmm. And, um, I think what self-publishing pro does, how do you think self-publishing pro answers that or, or solves that problem? I I have the perfect answer. Like usual. What's that? I would let Lee answer it, but I don't want to go ahead and make your wrong answer. And then I'll, I'll clear (laughs) it up forever because we'll grandstand and yada, yada, yada. Here's the, here's the thing. Anybody knows they can go on Google and type in, how to self-publish a book or how, right. how to self-publish a game, right? The problem with Google right now or any search engine or anything that you would, any advice you would find in an article online is you're not sure if you can trust that person or the person putting out that information, right? And um, so what do we do, the three of us? We get together when we're talking about our, self-publishing projects and we're like and i'm asking lee the other day who was your printer because you got Mm -hmm. really good printing on your your tarot deck here i'm doing a plug for your tarot deck although i'm covering up the name so people can't see it drifting moon tarot (laughs) (laughs) and it was it's gorgeous i mean the uh the magnetic box the printing everything is um was done so well so i pulled it off my shelf and i'm like I want to use a really good printer like this because they're not going to let me down. So I have personal um, information from someone else that I Mm -hmm. sort of trust. That's Lee White. And that's, I think that's what we're providing in this class is we're compiling all of the knowledge that we've gained over the years Mm -hmm. and all of the knowledge that of the people that we've worked with. Mm-hmm. So we're we're putting in a lot of information of people that we've learned from um, that are doing the same kinds of things, and hopefully, the the people that we know will trust us with this class. Someone right. coming to the, finding us on Google will just be another class where they're like, I don't know if I can trust these guys because they don't know us, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So right. that's kind of well, where I, I, I tell think you, the big thing. I mean, again, Will's like dancing around this big point the big thing is will saying is you can you can you, we've done a lot of projects already and you can trust us the big thing that I, my big takeaway so far we're still recording the class it's deep it's a deep class but uh mm-hmm. what i've learned is how much i didn't know and i've already done two projects and uh shipped them and advertised them and i you know so i just i mm-hmm. in my projects i just had a little piece of the pie of what publishing self-publishing is and jake had mm-hmm. his piece of the pie and will had his piece of the pie and you start combining them together when we get it's just like our uh children's book class uh, children's book pro i thought i knew a lot about children's book illustration and, and making a book and storytelling until i got together with jake and will and they had totally different ways of solving a problem 
and addressing mm-hmm. a certain issue or, or whatever. And it was better than what I was doing. And I was like, oh, like, for example, Will last week talked about some some advertising within Facebook. I've never ever thought about doing it. Um, how Indiegogo worked, I didn't even understand it. There's so many pieces of self-publishing, you almost mm-hmm. can't, if you haven't done it before and done it extensively, there's just no way you would know it all. I mean, step one is like, oh, can I get a book published? That's self-publishing, right? I, I just uh, send some files to Print Ninja and then they send you a book. Well, there's a million other steps. And right. it's and, and so we made it chronological, we made it step by step. Here's step one how to even think about your project and how to budget mm-hmm. for your project and how to how advertise to position your it, all that stuff. Yeah, all of it, how to ship it. I mean, all these things are, I, I, I heard of a, I don't know this um, person directly, so it's anecdotal a little bit but, and hearsay, but uh, a, a illustrator who had a really successful campaign, I want to say like $150,000 or something on their Kickstarter, and they misestimated the shipping and took all the profit. Like they didn't make anything on the Kickstarter and even went in the negative oh, because man. the shipping was incorrect. And so mm-hmm. there's just a lot of pieces of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I th- and I want to say like in that first week, w- so it's a nine-week long uh, course, each week the the lessons drop and they're all different phases of the self-publishing like journey. That first week you're going to learn, like we, we, sh- we give you the map. I actually like drew out a, like a chronological map of the production phase, the marketing phase, and like the growing your fan base phase of how to, how to get these things done. That's, that leads me to like this, this next big concern that most people have. And that's, they're like, yeah, I can, I can go print a book, you know, that, you know, I, I, I think I can figure that out. But my problem is no one's ever going to see this project. How do I even get it into people's hands? And that's one of the things that uh, we're actually preparing this week. One of the, the lectures that I just prepared is how do you use uh, social media in a way that's actually productive and effective, but maybe not just through your efforts, but through the combined efforts of other people working with influencers working with other people and i dig in deep into how you're going to want to do that um you know figuring out the terms and and the conditions for you know setting up a uh, an activation or a campaign with somebody so you know we we get into we get into so much of it i'm gonna can i can i tell you guys just real quick about my almost ten thousand dollar mistake in self-publishing yeah, let's hear it. I should probably put this in the class. I didn't even think about it. Maybe I will, but um, I'll go ahead and share it with you guys, our list, trusty listeners here. So I'm, I'm making my tarot deck. It's already funded. The, the files have already gone to the printer. Everything's moving forward as it's supposed to. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, my, uh, my, my printer is sending me all these fantastic-looking um, com- Im- images, comps and stuff like that, and... Uh, uh, you know, different pages and stuff and layouts. And I'm like, oh man, those look so good. I mean, I love, I love what you're sending. And, um, and then over the course, like there's like two weeks silence. And then I'm like, and I'm thinking in my head, like I cannot wait to get these proofs because of how good that looked. And, (laughs) and then, so I, 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 you know, another week goes by and I email like, Hey, I haven't got these proofs. Where are these proofs? Do I need to sign for them somewhere? Are they shipping somewhere? And they're like, Oh no, you approved the digital proofs. It's your project is printing. <laughs> <You're> t- <laughs> and I was like, You thought you were getting pr- uh, yeah, physical yeah, proofs. I thought I was getting hard copy. I mean, this is one of the things you always want to get a hard copy proof. Um, uh, if anything, just to check for typography uh, things and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, you there's really stuff do, you could see in print that you don't see in. It's, uh, there's sometimes. always something. There's always mm-hmm. something. And so they were like, nope, it's already in production. I mean, we're talking gold foil printing. Like Will said, there's magnetic boxes that have already been made. I mean, they're already in full production of this. I can't stop mm-hmm. the train mm-hmm. at this mm-hmm. point. And the printing was, I can't remember. I don't know if it was quite 10,000, but it, it was a lot. Um, and I just had to cross my fingers as these tarot decks crossed the ocean on a big boat <laughs> and then they landed at my door one day and I was I remember sitting there with the exacto knife getting ready to open the box and I'm like please let these things look good because <laughs> <laughs> right. if they didn't I'd have to reprint I mean there's no other option it just that is a ten thousand dollar tidbit tip right there <laughs> is that your printer especially if they're overseas may not have the same understanding of what the process is that you do 
And so you need to you need to make sure you understand what you're getting and what you're asking for and be specific. Right. So, well, we don't want to spend too much time on this, no. but, you know, um, like I said, the enrollment for that's going to be February 27th uh, through March 4th. Now, if you're s- still want, you know, on the fence or you, or you just want to know more about it, we have a f- six video like free introductory um, course to self-publishing pro that we're releasing via email. So you're going to want to get on our email list. And the best way to do that is just go to svslearn.com and sign up for email notifications and we'll get you, we'll get you, uh, make sure that you get those, um, the, that like free videos series. It's six videos. I think they're each about 10, 12 minutes long. And we just kind of break down some of the, some of the processes and give you stuff that you can like start working on right now before you even take the class. Um, uh, so do check that out. Okay. Our first question for today uh, this one comes in from, uh, let me see here. Wait, did I want to do mailbag ha- or were you doing a question? We'll do the question, then we'll do mailbag. How's, okay. Or do you want to do mailbag first? I guess go ahead and do a question. People get sick of us bantering. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do a question. Okay, so uh, let's see here. This is one that uh, we I had l- queued up for the last episode. We didn't get to it. It's the second one on our on the email I sent you guys. It's okay. from Emily. She says, am I wearing rose-tinted glasses? Hi, guys. I've been a longtime listener and have done your Children's Book Pro course, which has been amazing and very useful. Thank you. Um, I worry, though, with my ability to see what's wrong with my work. I feel like I'm applying lessons you're teaching in my work, but when I watch your critiques, I don't always pick up the mistakes that you point out. Does this mean I'm thinking my work is doing all the right things, but really it's not? How can I tell if I could see what you guys see? And then she gives us a link to her portfolio. And uh, I will share the screen here. But it's the, the she's asking the question that made us um, essentially want to do uh, um, uh, how to fix your art. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like, are you guys seeing her, her artwork here? I just, just pulled it up. Uh, yeah. Not on the screen. You're not sharing it yet. Okay, hold on. Sorry. But, um, yeah. So, how would you answer that question? How do you how do you fix your own art? Essentially, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's, we we did put together the course. God, we sound like a freaking commercial. I don't I don't want to I don't want to advertise that we did put together an entire thing on how to evaluate your art. But I will say this: at the end of the day, you can do as million checklists as you want. You need somebody else to look at your work. I mean, you just can't do it. You cannot do it because you're so close to the work. You're seeing things that other people didn't see. And you may be missing the big picture because you're looking at the small details. You might not like how a foot was rendered in a piece, so you always look at the foot. But Mm -hmm. somebody coming in fresh, you have to get, and I don't care what level you are. If you're Jake's level, Jake needs a good critique coming up. (laughs) <laughs> to fix his own art. Yeah, I need, if your I Will's level, if you're my level, right away. we all we we share work with each other. I mean, Will was sharing his box earlier uh, tonight for the game that he's making, and and he's been sharing mm-hmm. the artwork. You have to get somebody to look at it. You cannot evaluate your own work, and that person needs to be better and farther along in their career than you are. It can't be an, a, just a rando SCBWI peer group. They don't know what they're talking about. It doesn't have I to be us either. I'm not advocating for us. We're not even doing that right now. Um, but it's it's got to be somebody. I mean, you gotta you gotta get it. You gotta there. There's some great stuff with this person's work, and there's some problems with this person's work, and it's too much to go into it here about why a, a slight tweak to this person's work and their work would get 100 percent better. I can guarantee you that. And mm-hmm. and keep in mind, there's there's levels like. Like Emily's work is really good. There's really, good. really nice things. There's really fun things happening in it, and she is well on her way to doing, um, you know, really, really professional work. But the thing is, like, in the when you first start, when you have five hundred to a thousand hours in illustration, you really can't critique your work yet. You know, you just you, you're always in that stage of wondering, like, is this good? And and if I go back to when I was in art school, I remember 
us all, all of our peers we would we would uh, you know we would do our assignment and we would show each other what we were working on and our everyone was like I hope the teacher likes it right so it's like this this thing of where we were like hoping magically that we had done something really good because we couldn't tell ourselves right and it was all horrible <laughs> right <laughs> yeah I mean it was all terrible like if I if I looked at if I looked at it at everything that we were doing as a class today as a teacher and I was I was honest behind our backs like I was talking to you guys about it I it would be like this is really really awful student work you know like it's just but but it, but I mean like it fits that level of of, of right, work. and you it, understand it, what that level is. So your job, you're right. not trying, you're not comparing them against Chris Van Alsberg and saying, oh, right. you know, you, it should be here. You know what level it should be at that. Let's just say freshman level. It's got a certain right. look to it. You know, it's funny that you think. But, go ahead, Will. Sorry, I don't want to derail. Well, the mindset it, what is, if you're if you don't know, if you're guessing, like I think my work is really good, but you don't know. You're just not far enough along, and so like like we get to a level, you know, and there's there's levels all the way along, and we're, we're still progressing, hopefully, right? Um, but what, I think once you get to a really professional level, you know that your work is good. What you can't see at that point are the little things. You've got the big stuff nailed. So like when I was showing you you guys my game box today, and you're like, mm -hmm. that looks amazing. That was your first thought, you know, was like, oh, wow, that looks amazing. You might want to change this this little detail in the corner, and I look at it. And I'm like, oh yeah, yep, you're right. You know, so it's it's like the little stuff. But like what we're talking about, and I think with with the more beginner work, you know, like like this like the splash image on Emily's page here. Mm -hmm. It she put it first. In my opinion, it is her best, and yet like she knew it was her best, so she put it first. The one that you're looking at right now. Mm -hmm. However, it's got some some still some big problems with it. Like, you know, like the like the foreground is probably overall a little bit too dark. Yeah. And and some more light could be brought in there. Um and again, beginning painters paint too the, dark and they draw the character, too light. All we see of the character is the, the back well, of the Well, that brings me that brings you know. me to the point that I was going to make is that you think especially if you haven't had a formal education, you think art is individual and everybody's got their own thing, and they sort of do, but it's not as individual as you think. In other words, almost all beginners go through a certain look. It doesn't matter what kind of work they're doing. Like, uh, I don't know who said it just a second ago, but I think Will said it. They draw characters too dark. They tend to make things too detailed. They add too many light sources. They over-render. I mean, th these, are, these are, it's not, I mean, almost everybody, it's kind of, Again, funny, because I would never think like, oh, a whole freshman class at an entire university of people from all over the place would have a similar look. And yet they do. You can tell from the work, like Will <laughs> said, some, some are better than others and, and, and whatnot. But you can say, oh, that's probably a freshman. And then you can say, oh, that's probably a sophomore. Like, it's, it's mm -hmm. uncanny. And a four-year school, you can tell where people are, mm -hmm. regardless of if you like the work or not or if it's your style or whatever. So... I don't know. It's just kind of it's just kind of funny that some people resist the learning. They think, "Oh, art is individual. It's just got to come out of me." But then everybody sort of makes the same mistakes along the way. And like Will said, you got to put time in the seat and get the mileage to be able to see it. And I think this person, Emily, is at the stage where, again, a few slight tweaks and she is yeah. money. Yeah. She's over rendering. She's doing that stuff, except for she's doing it exceptionally well. She's over rendering. She's has, she has too much contrast. Uh, and too much black in the image, um, so she's she's mm -hmm. super close to to nailing it. Now, yeah, if I agree, would, should would, if I were Emily, would I trust advice from a guy who under renders? Oh, I don't under render. <laughs> it's a perfect amount of render. When, once you realize you don't have to render, the the skies, the clouds part, the sun hits your face. And you're just like, <laughs> <laughs> so sweet. I want to point out when you go into her shop. Like there's some illustrations here where I'm just like, this is, you know, this is so good. This is perfect That's for a nice. greeting card, you know, mm -hmm. like a bunch of these greeting card designs are just exactly the level of rendering and like Agreed. interestingness that you would want. And, uh, and so I feel like 
you, you, you nailed it, Lee, like just a couple of tweaks. Like I look at this one and, uh, it's like a, uh, a Christmas one. There's a star hanging and there's like vine and, and, and mm-hmm. holly on it, but it's got like a whimsical fantasy element. There's a fairy in there. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, uh, you know, your character design is so good except for like a few little anatomical tweaks that mm-hmm. need to happen. And I think my advice for this, this uh, for Emily, is sort of the advice that I give so many artists at this stage, and that is just do 20, 30, 50 master studies of some artists who are really good in the areas that you struggle with. Try to make as close to a copy as you can so that you could show them to somebody and say which one was the original artist and have them be like, oh, I'm not sure, right? Um, because what happens is every time you do that, you pick up something and your brain is sort of wired now to do that one thing that you never have like thought to do before. And then when you sit down to design a character, you're like, oh wait, I remember they spaced the eyes this certain distance apart. I'm going to try that with my character. Or they had the, the pose had sort of like a, a nice relaxing like gesture to it. I'm going to try that with this, you know, with this pose that I'm doing now. And that's how you that's how you really start to pick up. And master studies like that is as old as the Renaissance. Like <laughs> that's what people have been doing for a thousand years of art instruction. And if you haven't done a master study, and I don't mean like go do a, a study of Michelangelo. I mean find another artist in your space who, or uh, not even in your space, but but that you love what they're doing, and just try to learn from what they're doing by making replicas of what they're doing you know don't show those to anybody you don't have to like that's not something you share online it's just stuff that stays in like hidden sketchbooks do you you guys still do that i still do it yeah i do it too i I, I, I was uh uh, making this uh, some characters for uh for some paintings in my my children's book and i've never really nailed in my style how to draw a profile view uh, like a side view of the character I'm good oh, at the right. front and yeah. three quarter view, but the uh, but the but that side Those are view, hard. It's just odd because I don't want to give them too much chin. I don't know. It just never looked right to mm-hmm. me. So I did a deep dive on on people working, just like you said, working in my style who had done characters from the side, and I was able to kind of parse. I did study after study of them, and I kind of made my own amalgamation of what they were doing. It's so helpful and it's so quick. You know, That's good. You nail it, nail it pretty quick. Yeah. All right. Do you want to get to to mailbag? Uh, mailbag. So we uh, which... had a lot of que- a lot of questions, <laughs> or not a lot of questions, a lot of comments on the union issue that I brought up last week because I make thoughtful and thought provoking little statements <laughs> that everybody responds to. <laughs> um, but we had a lot, and so I just wanted to kind of go over some of it. But but uh, the gist of it again is uh, here. I want to ask you guys a question. Now, we talk about this, so forget our conversations between us three. We've set up a system of, in publishing and illustration in general where you talk about which brush to use. We talk about which paper to use and which colors to use and the perspective and all the stuff. When do we talk about the money and the business? And, it ne- and the answer for most of you guys is going to be it never, ever happens. As a matter of fact, you're almost discouraged from talking about the business. In a mm-hmm. weird way. It, it should be front and center. Hey, I made $10,000 on this cover. I made $50 on this book cover or this character. And here's the rights that I licensed. No one, just think about it in your life. How many times do you see and hear people talking specifically about how much, yet we spend all of our time learning how to do it, trying to do it, thinking about it, advertising it, but don't talk about the money. And that was sort of my point is that we've set up a system where... The people that pay are the only people that talk. I guarantee you they are talking about the money. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's kind of weird. And so what they've done is they've set us up all against each other. Nobody knows what's happening with the person next to them. And, and nobody knows what to ask for. And their job, like Willis said this very clearly before, which I agree with, their job is to get you to work for as cheap as you possibly can and get the quality that they need. And their money will match that. So it just seems very odd that everything is sort of stacked against the artist until we start talking about it, whether we have a union or not, 
I could care less about that, whether it's formal or not. But it's just odd that we don't talk about it. And if you bring it up, you're looked at like, oh my gosh, what are you talking about? Why, why are you talking about how much you make? Talk about the perspective. Talk about the brushes. It's just, mm-hmm. it pisses me off, to be honest, because <laughs> I need to make my house payment. You know, right, right. I need to pay for this stuff and, and I need to have health care. And, and like, how do we navigate these things? And, and we're just not going to do it if we don't talk about it openly. Um, so which was my point for the union. So a couple of people, I just want to, again, we're doing the mailbag. So a lot of people commented kind of clarifying some of the questions we had for the union. So one of the general clarifications was a union sets a base price. It does not set the price for everybody uh, it, it, using the film industry as an analogy you know Arnold Schwarzenegger is not working for uh, scale what they call scale which is the baseline minimum now we don't need a union to set a baseline minimum if everybody agreed held hands we all hold hands digitally on zoom and agree we're not nobody does a book in the United States for less than 10 grand I guarantee you 10 grand would start to happen or books wouldn't get published those are the only two options but it doesn't because there's always somebody who will work for less because we've also glorified the starving artist persona. Hey, I'm do I'm just doing it because I love it. I don't care how much I get paid. I just because I the love, you know, that doesn't work. No other industry does that. Again, don't talk about the money. Um <clears throat> so I want to follow up with this this one guy who's in a union. He's in the film union union and he knows more than I do. So I just want to follow up with what he said. He said, as a member of a film union, I can say that the union only bargains for minimum and labor rules for all workers. It's not a set price. It's a set minimum price. People with experience or prestige negotiate their own deals. It's referred to as scale, and there are different scales defined for different projects um, and different artists, too. Uh, for example, the scale for a low-budget indie project is not the same scale for a big studio project and streamers. I don't know what that is. Um, the union collectively bargains for the minimum rate required uh, contributions to Retirement from the studios, safety protections, and basic rules of the road for contracts. That's all they do. Small independent people have the ability to get waivers based on the size and budget of their project, so they can still do business. The biggest problem I've seen in the union is the lack of education of members who believe unions are designed to eliminate competition from non-union members, which it is, which it is totally not. The purpose of the union is to fight for labor conditions for all workers regardless of the membership. When a union fights for something like minimum wage and overtime, it benefits every worker and the industry. The labor laws we have today are a direct result of union action. If child labor, uh, uh, wait, action, even if you've never been in a union, you are benefiting from the efforts of organized labor. The reason we have child labor laws is a result of unions. Corporations did not come up with the rules out of the goodness of their hearts. That's what I was saying earlier. Right now, the people who hire us are in total control of our industry. Um, you have legal right to organize in the U.S. US uh, in the U.S., writers of all kinds have already unionized. Um, I can relate to Will's gripes with the stupidity of within unions, especially big ones like the teachers' union, where a lot of people are staff. We don't have that problem. Um, the story uh, Will mentions about auto workers, I believe, is a mischaracterization, a mischaracterization per, <laughs> perpetuated by executives wanting to draw attention away from bad management choices. The workers didn't cause the collapse of the auto American auto industry. The executives did. Uh, that gets into a separate issue. But anyway, I, j- I just thought it was an interesting take. I know it's a little bit more pro-union than some, some of the, you guys said. Oh, union is for lazy people. Let me tell, clear that up. A union, and I'm not advocating saying that we have to have a union, but a union does not guarantee employment. I think within the teacher industry, you can kind of float, you know, education industry, you can float if you're not a great teacher. But in our industry, or like the film industry, writers, you don't work if you're not good and you're not working. So it's not for lazy people. But my big gripe is just that nobody's talking about the finances. And because we don't talk mm-hmm. about it, the whole thing keeps going lower and lower. And that's my question. My next question to you guys, and what I'll end with, because I know this is getting long, is is there, are the rates going up? Are the rates going down? Are the rights getting better? Are the rights getting worse? Are the payment terms, once you do agree on an amount, are they getting better? Are they getting worse? In children's publishing, in the children's publishing, uh, it used to be three payments. Now they're saying that it can be up to five payments. Say you negotiate $10,000. That'll be yeah. split over five payments, sometimes a year after production. 
So how many of you and guys do that? And some, some contracts say payment upon publication. What happens if the book, the publisher's like, uh, we don't want to publish this book. Uh, we need to take a tax, get a tax break. You don't get that last payment, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. But then we're just like, well, okay, publisher's in charge. I guess I'm just going to do what they say. I, I just think it's so, stupid. So, yeah, my question then is, what do you, what do we do? What do you do? What's the steps? Do we just keep going as is? Like, I'm not going to put words in Will's mouth, but I assume it's don't work for the publishers. <laughs> go, go make <laughs> no, your no, own. Here, here's my. Go put, print your own book. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason we can't say, oh, we just arbitrarily create a minimum is what Will's saying is, is that would be collective bargaining and you can't do that. But mm -hmm. here's what. My proposal is a master document, like maybe a website, where when you, when any illustrator gets a job, you say whether, like maybe we have four or five classifications for clients. On one end is the mom and pop shop. On the other end is Apple. Yeah. You know, big company. Yeah. And here's, so here's the level. I, I did a level three client, um, you know, based on this criteria. And here's how much I made, and here was the rights that I negotiated. They could even just be pull-down menus for a range. It doesn't have to be the exact dollar mm -hmm. amount or something. But then all of a sudden we get this database. Hey, most people who are doing, and, and you know, this, the uh, pricing and ethical guidelines from the Graphic Arts Guild is a good starting point. If you guys don't know about that, Graphic Arts Guild puts out a book every year. It's, it's digital now. Uh, I think you can get a hard copy, but it's just a guideline of prices, but where are they getting those numbers? And sometimes those numbers are artificially high and don't cover enough stuff. And so I'd like to see, hey, here's the whole thing. Here's here's a thousand people that have done a book for a scholastic level publisher, and here's how much they made. You get an average, you know where you're starting to stand. Um, I don't see what would be wrong with that. That's not bargaining. You're just saying, here's what happened, not here's what needs to happen. I gotta feel like there's there's got to be something like this already out there that we just haven't been made aware of. I don't. I mean, it if may be. If anybody knows something, please comment in the text. And also for you, those of you guys who are listening, if you go to the YouTube uh, channel and watch this, comment and just let me know. Have you ever had a money conversation where you know what somebody else is making with an il illustration mm -hmm. and what kind of rights they but negotiated? It, it, it could be that it's just something like you. Um, just to make it like anonymous so you don't have to say, you could just say, hey, Penguin Random House, you know, you go on there and it says Penguin Random House paid in advance for this type of book and this is how much the deal was with the rights. And, you know, we could even go so far as you could upload the contract with names and, and addresses and like pertinent information like blurred out just to see what the contract looks like because why is that? I don't know. That's probably NDA, but why should it be? Like, we, you know, you want to know what you, you got. I mean, you, you know, you you want to know what's going on out there. Otherwise, uh, you're you're just blindly saying yes to what seems like a the, your only option. You know. Let me let me point out something specifically because you know we're talking about getting into specifics and no one talks about it. Point out one little contract thing that I've learned about recently. So we all know that, you know, a publisher, pay, we've talked about net and, and list price and stuff like that on this podcast, so I'm not going into that. But there's another little clause that I learned about recently from David Hone. Thank you, David, for, for this one. That was, it, you know, when a book has been out for a while, it starts to get discounted, right? It goes to book clubs. It goes to discount booksellers and whatnot. And the price drops, right? So you would think, like, okay, so say, say a, a discounted book buyer buys your book for 50%, well, you think, okay, I'll make, the publisher is now making 50% of what they used to on the book when it was full price, and I'll make my normal cut from what that 50% level is, right? Nope. When a book gets deeply discounted, the publisher reduces the price in half, but your fee also gets reduced by half. Mm -hmm. So the overall cost is reduced by half, and then you're, so now you're making, uh, uh, you know, 50% and then another 50% less twice so it happens twice to the illustrator but only once to the publisher does that make sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so if you were making 10 percent off whatever the sell, sell price is you now make five percent or if you were making five percent now you make 2.5 percent so why is the illustrator hit twice in that scenario where the publisher's only hit once 
doesn't make it yeah, makes doesn't make any absolutely sense. Absolutely no sense. Anyway, all right. I'm gonna get down off my soapbox. Did box. Will leave or is he still here? I'm checked out because I feel like you uh, you brought in an expert, but you didn't give me a chance. I wasn't asking for to your bring point. in an expert. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, to to ask for someone's opinion. I mean, like, like you took one side, and you left me hanging where I didn't even know that was coming. No, I didn't take so, a side. I'm just reading. I'm just reading what the comment is. I, I don't know anything. If there's if there's something he's not right about, and I know again, he says unions are not perfect, especially the bigger the organization. Um, but go ahead. What's a, what's a what's a rebuttal? That's what I'm saying. If if you had told me. This is what we're going to do today, and I'm going to bring on an expert that that contradicts what you said, Will. Do you want a chance to go find an expert that supports it or contradicts the other side? Instead, I'm just sitting here. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> let's have well, let's have Will. You can you could talk about it next episode if yeah, you want. Come on. we'll, we'll battle, but, battle with a battle. I don't but care I think the point, the, the point, the yeah, unions aside, what, how do you feel about some sort of document or resource where people can just know what is going on on the financial side like is that that's i, I feel like that's like i mean if we it can see it already kickstarter. happening somewhere you know what i mean right I mean, like kickstarter, so you, you mean like a graphic artist guild book that tells you what prices yeah an be? illustration guild book or it something it never like works Pr- price price th- those kinds of things don't work in my opinion I mean, like, mm-hmm. you know. So the answer would there's be the nobody real world. knows anything. So the Graphic Artist Guild book doesn't work, right? We've already they've already tried to set prices, and employers will look at that. Well, so what if you go by their prices, then a client says, "Oh, we can never afford to pay that." <laughs> exactly. And, and so then, my point. Then what you do just you do? my point for a basic minimum. No, but here's here's the here's the other point is there's nothing stopping, like there's always an, a another class of artists ready to do it for whatever price is being paid. And it right. might mean that you don't find the artists living in California or in Seattle or in New York where cost of living is very high. You start working with artists who are in like Oklahoma or Wyoming or the Philippines or, you know, uh, Cambodia or something who still have access to a tablet and the internet and can do the job for, uh, you know, 30% of what you might have to pay somebody living in a really, you know, expensive city like Paris or London or something like that. So the problem is, is you can't tell a publisher you can only work, you can only work with um, this set group of people. How do you, how do you force that? Like, how do you do that? Do you get somebody who's like starving in Wyoming to say no to a job where a $30,000 children's book would like absolutely you know cover whatever they needed or or the other thing is is you start branching out to people who don't need the money and and it's just like i'm creative my spouse totally makes all the money i need i just interviewed or did a uh, a portfolio review for a guy who's his spouse has a really good job and he does art um it's not a career for him yet. He wants it to be, but he doesn't need to rely on the money. So he'll take whatever job pays, pays low. Mm-hmm. I really do like, Will does have a point where it's like, you could set up all this stuff, but how do you force a publisher to, to pay something well, that, if there's someone there? I don't there I really know that unions are the, I'm not, I'm not fighting for a union, but I'm, I'm fighting for information. That's that's mm-hmm. and and so right now we've just given it all the inf- all the power to the people that are hiring us and I'll tell you where where the free market ends up here it ends up at Fiverr because the, it's a race mm-hmm. to the bottom. Yes and no. I mean, like there's clients that will never hire anybody off of Fiverr. In fact, that's in my lesson today. Interestingly enough, for Self Publishing Pro. Um, but here, here's the thing. I, th- I would suspect the reason that you have Screen Actors Guild, the reason you have a writer's uh, union, is because there's more money. Think of the industry. Hollywood, mm-hmm. that industry dwarfs children's books. That's right? true. And the, the, the salaries that they're willing to pay, or salaries, the, the fees they're willing to pay for actors and writers are substantially, I mean, they dwarf the children's book industry. I, I would it's, imagine it's that there's just point. not enough money there 
for there to support a union. Maybe uh, that's that would be my the Screen another. Actors Guild, and I want to I want to say the Animation Guild, all these little like um, unions that are involved in Hollywood, they're at most, you know, ten thousand, fifteen thousand, thirty thousand um, members, right? And if you think about um, the count, the kind of money that Hollywood, the industry that Hollywood is, it's billions and billions of dollar industry and if you look at publishing you have how many publishers big big publishers 10 total maybe something like that and how many illustrators that they they're working with you know i think there's there's probably hundreds of thousands of illustrators but how many are actually professional working mm-hmm. you right. know and writers i think it's a, a smaller a much smaller amount it is. I mean, I feel like an organization like Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators has more of a responsibility. Maybe they're not a union, mm-hmm. but they do a better job of the business side of stuff. They, you know, every SCBWI thing is, uh, you know, I'm bashing on them. It's, well, everybody's going to hate on me, but it's just like how to make a dummy or like getting more voice in your character. Like, how about telling yeah. us how to make a, a living, being a little more. How to negotiate being, rights for your contract. Right. <laughs> Right. Mm. How how do you get uh, three payments instead of five in your negotiation fa- negotiation right. phase of a of a contract? I, I mean, think, I guarantee you, everybody you, said I won't take five payments. I'll only take three payments for a children's book. It would be three payments. I promise. No, no, I think that in some ways we do a disservice to the younger illustrators coming up by painting a picture that that um that they all it, it's hard to put into words but that they should all their ideal should be um to do freelance work okay mm-hmm. and having said that i realize i'm in a position now where you know i don't need freelance work because i have other things going on um that that i'm not just totally reliant on that and i realize also that it is the area where you cut your teeth, the area where you get your chops so that you can go on to do other things. But I really feel like the goal, if you if you ever really want financial independence, because, because right now inflation is, I mean, we've talked about the history of illustration, right? Mm-hmm. The, south, the, the amount of money is not going up. It's stayed steady. There's, there's, mm-hmm. Articles have been written about this in the magazines that have gone by the wayside now, like mm-hmm. Communication Arts and, you know, and and, um, and uh, I, some of the other publisher publications like Step by Step and things like that. But we've we've you guys we've we've been in the industry for what thirty years or so, and mm-hmm. I learned about this when I was in school. So before I even started, more than thirty years ago, I learned that that uh, illustrators like J.C. Liondecker would get, like, I mean, they were like movie stars. They right. literally were movie mm-hmm. stars. They, had they sponsors would make, and- they would make three to $5,000 for a cover of the Saturday Evening Post when a house price was 500 bucks. So yeah, in the 30s. put that into today's <laughs> t- terms. If today a house costs 400000 uh-huh. they were making 10 times that on one illustration. Right. They were making $4 Which million. You- dollars. Makes you wonder how much a magazine made back in the twenties and. Well, they were the only things. It was before TV, yeah. so that was that. Everybody had the Saturday Evening Post. In fact, I was sitting at dinner with my ninety-four-year-old stepdad the other night, and mm-hmm. we were talking about this because he was asking me what I was into, and I asked him, "Did you get the Saturday Evening Post?" "Oh yeah." I mean, he remembers getting it, you know, wow. it was, it was every, everybody got it. He, he, you know, he said, so anyway, well, it's the same the- thing with, uh, cartoon syndication and newspapers. You know, if you got syndicated, you're in a thousand, two thousand, five thousand newspapers, right? right? If you got a universal right. syndication contract. And so, and each newspaper was paying, you know, a hundred bucks or I don't know exactly what it was, but, a, a per strip. That you would, right. you know, so, so yeah, you made bank. Right. So my long, my overarching message is we're making less and less because of inflation. 
which is mm-hmm. actually scheduled by our government. Um, they have a target of 2% a year. Sometimes they miss that, and, they, and it goes way higher than that. Yeah. But, but inflation is happening, whether you like it or not. So if you're he- hearing this today in 10 years, and you're, and, you're making, and you're working in freelance, yes, you'll be making less money in 10 years. And in 20 years, yes, you'll be making even less money because this, the salaries aren't going up. Knowing that and having that information, you're to try to fix, I think it's a waste of time to say, well, we need a union because you're trying to fix a system that is already proven to be broken. Mm-hmm. Why not be the publisher? Why not be the business, own the business, own the IP? Yeah, so that's where I you, think the goal should be. How would you ever be. learn how to do that? Oh, wait, there's a course coming out called self-publishing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, like you, you need to get the skills. So you need to be doing a lot of work. Sorry. For me, it was I was getting a lot of freelance. Mm-hmm. I cut my teeth, teeth by doing stacks and stacks of illustrations that suck. Mm-hmm. You have to get through all They're that. Still doing that? Yeah, I'm just well, kidding. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, will my work change in ten years from now? Hopefully, right? Hopefully, it'll get yeah. better. No, you. But but yeah. you have to get to a point where where you're good enough to make your own uh, whatever it is, whatever you want to work on, and and take it to market yourself because you, you're the only one who's ever going to pay you what you're worth, right? Yeah, that that's the, the I just do want to offer like a, a little rope of hope here that people can grasp onto and <laughs> pull out of this mire of like depression that we've <laughs> been wallowing in. The, I. I, I agree. So, you know, if you, if you go back to newspapers and magazines in the previous century where, like, you know, if you were able to get uh, spotlighted, you know, a cover, a syndication or something like that, you could write your own ticket and you could do well because distribution. Your image was going to be in everybody's home and you'd be a household name. Yeah. But it was available to 50 people, <laughs> uh, yeah. maybe a thousand people at most, right? And I think now, where are the, where's the distribution? Where are the eyeballs happening? Where's everybody's focus on? It's a little device that hold, you know, you hold in your pocket, it's your phone, and they're on social media. Pick your social media platform, that's where you're on. And so mm-hmm. your job as an artist, I think, is, to start growing that particular community around your work, have a voice, have a perspective on something, have a unique style that's recognizable. Innovate. And I think innovate. And I think the, the most important part of this is make something that people want to have, that people want to, to own and support you with, right? Make a book, make a calendar, Make a tarot deck. Make a card game. Uh, make a web comic. Just make something. Don't just post random images on it. Make greeting cards. You know, mm-hmm. you you have so much power as a visual artist. Don't make greeting cards. Make, make something that. Don't, don't invite make something that into my space. <laughs> make something other than greeting. Make, cards. So, make something that hasn't been done. I I had a, a conversation yesterday with a guy. I, I I told you about it a little bit, Jake. And yeah. and it went deep this guy um is an is an amazing guy i i hope we can have him on the podcast at some point Mm -hmm. but he one of the things he did and and he's done many things in his career i believe he's in his late he's in his late 60s right now Mm -hmm. um he invented a way a program so he's an artist right he's an Mm -hmm. illustrator but he's also he's got the left brain mathematics type stuff programming type stuff right it's a double threat yeah so he he figured out like he just on his own decided that um he wanted to through getting illustration jobs for car companies back when they did a lot of illustrated brochures and cutaways right so he was doing like cutaway um you know what that is right cutaway yeah, yeah, it's cutaways like a before. detail view yeah. You can see through the roof, down into the parts and in the engine. And I do those all the time. I draw those all the time. (laughs) So he's doing that. And then he realizes, like, there's no program to draw a tire tread, right? Mm. And these 
um, tire companies are coming out with different tread patterns all the time. The problem is they can't see what it's going to look like before they actually make the thing, right? And they want to sell it. They want to put it out in their in a brochure. I don't know all right. the marketing reasons, but they want to, you know, like anything, you want to see it. So this guy figured out in Illustrator and doing some coding how to make the tread wrap mm -hmm. in vectors. Okay, and this is this is back. I mean, now this is like probably common stuff, but this I believe this was in the in the seventies. Oh wow! Or eighties. It was seventies or eighties. It was like when he, Illustrator first came out. Okay. It might have been eighties, but anyway. Yeah. He went to a tire company with this. And he showed them, <laughs> and also he could it would color the thing too, right? And it mm -hmm. would the colors would, would would I mean it looks like a photograph. When yeah. he first showed it to me, I thought it was a photograph. And then he zoomed in. I'm like, holy cow. And then he showed all the vectors, the, the yeah. you know, the vector drawing. Well, he, no one told him to do that, <laughs> right? But he was able to set his price with the time. They, they were like, well, what do you want for this? You know, and he, mm -hmm. he set a really high price that they had to meet. No one else, no other illustrator had that. Yeah. Where are you going to go? Where else yeah. are you going to go to get that? You, yeah, we we have to think differently if we want to ever reach financial independence. Mm -hmm. we, we just can't think of like trying to be like everyone else because there's there are hundreds of thousands of illustrators. Well, they're all week, trying to compete. For we're the same going job. to next week. We're shifting this podcast into be all about real estate. <laughs> and it's going to be three point perspective podcast about real estate, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your real estate investments. <laughs> All right, let's no, move on. I, what's funny is even if you go into real estate right now, nobody's buying or selling houses. So <laughs> it's like you it's such tie, a st tie, stagnant market, right. too. So right now, real realtors are like, maybe I should become an illustrator. Hmm. Um, can, I, can we shift gears? And I want to talk about PewDiePie. Can I say one more this thing? This is the Just moment I've been waiting it's, for. It's, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with this. I, I have a gallery show coming up that I think I told you about. It's, and mm -hmm. I'm doing a traditional watercolor painting. I've lost all my glasses. And I'm painting an original piece of artwork, and I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> it How many so pairs of glasses do you have? Zero now. I had six, and somehow they're, what they're the totally heck? gone. I have one pair left, but, the, but it doesn't have any... Um, arms what do you call it? where would they have gone i don't know i don't know where they are but the painting is due on saturday i don't have enough time to go get glasses so i'm trying to do this original painting and i have no idea just go to walgreens and get readers Blurry. get oh that's a good idea i'm almost three x so readers or whatever your eyes maybe, maybe it's better if i can't see it anyway maybe go ahead I mean, honestly i think your art looks better when i when i blur my vision a little <laughs> bit so I'm gonna put that on <laughs> on the painting. Please blur your eyes for this. Just a little instruction. Yeah. <laughs> All, right, All right. Have you guys heard about PewDiePie? You guys know who he is, right? Know who he is. So for the YouTuber. uninitiated, he is he has 111 million subscribers on YouTube, and he got that from doing like video game videos. I don't know. I'm only he seeing. He had like that one contest level. with that other channel in out of India like five years ago, four right, years ago. Right, Mr. Beast has eclipsed him now. But mm -hmm. PewDiePie just dropped a video that said, I drew every day for 100 days. He's getting into art. He says, I always wanted to be an artist. And I want to share, um, the. I was going to share the YouTube video, but it kept playing ads. Um, so I just took some screen grabs, right? So you see this okay? No, because I don't have glasses. Okay. <laughs> I'm serious. Is it not loading? It. It's everything's just blurry. Let me, he hasn't let shared me try that again. Yet. Can it do? There you go. You seen that? Uh huh. Okay, so this is just screen grabs from the video, but I want to show his progress in a hundred days. This is just him sitting down and drawing a hundred days. And I want to point this out, and I, and I want to give PewDiePie like all the credit in the world for, because he is influential to a bunch of um, uh, impressionable people, I would say. And we're in this time now, we're in this space now where a lot of people are like, 
artists are gatekeepers. You know, they're they're holding back this information of how to draw. So this is why I'm going to AI because I can tell the computer what I want it to draw, and I don't, you know, I don't have to um, rely on an artist to make the art for me. I could just have the computer do it, right? And PewDiePie is like, hey, watch me. I'm just gonna sit down with a sketchbook and a pen and draw every day for 100 days and uh, and let's see where, where I could get. So this right here is day 32. In this video, he already did a, I'll draw th every day for 30 days. And this is his follow-up video. I did it for is, 100 is days. Is he drawing these from his imagination or is he looking at reference? What's he looking at? Does he say? He's doing both. He's doing um, reference and imagination and he's actually posing himself at photos and trying to do like a character in the pose of himself you know like not so for those a of drawing you guys of himself listening, at least from my blurry view of this it's sort of a half anime looking character yeah he's he's doing anime he's he's essentially he wants to learn anime style is what he's what he's trying to do okay so this is day 32 now we're at day 50 oh a lot better i don't know if you could see wow. that wow yeah the jump there um big jump in i think day one through 32 was just like how do i hold this pen how do i make a, how do i make a mark and now on day 50 he you know he's sketching he's he's dropped the pen for this particular sketch and he's doing like girl faces mm -hmm. um but there's more proportion to it that's that's uh, leans realistic you know definitely there's, more there's, nuance there's, in, in how he's grouping the hair together and stuff right mm. right here is day 74 so he's just he's doing like six to seven drawings per page in his sketchbook, or maybe this is seventy nine. I don't know. Seventy four. It's mainly heads. It's mainly just heads. He sort of indicates a mm -hmm. neck and a shoulder, but it's mainly heads. I want to point out too, like he's focusing on one thing to to learn, and that's faces, heads, torsos, right? Of an um, anime which, girl character. I mean, it's very specific. Right. Of an anime, very specific. Which you can, if you do one thing for 100 days, you're absolutely going to be competent in it by the end of it. Okay, so here is day 90 something. And then this is day 100. Some color. So he's now yeah. uh, putting marker in. You can see he didn't put enough time in drawing frogs, but the girl, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. she actually, there's some, there's some, co some competency here. Now, is he a professional artist? No. Is he uh, someone who I think had zero drawing skill that can now make an, uh, uh, an adequate drawing? Yes, absolutely. If he did it 365 days straight or two years straight or five years straight, he'd be a legit artist. Get him a tablet, get him Procreate, something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, you could totally see that this is within the reach of, of, uh, of learning and possibility. I tell you what I'm impressed with is the fact that he has such really nice line weight changes in the, in mm -hmm. the, in the line work. I mean, it just goes from thick to thin. That looks very competent. Um, no matter what he's drawing. That's, I don't know if he picked that up along the way. Did somebody tell him to do that? I, I just wonder. I don't think he's getting like any specific training or, or taking courses or anything. I think this it's is nice. just him. You know, opening a sketchbook for an hour every day and drawing in it. So, mm -hmm. big shout out to PewDiePie. Um, you know, if you guys haven't subscribed to him yet, maybe go check him out. I just want to help him I'd out, get a few more subscribers. Is, is, is he still doing <laughs> it? I don't know. I don't know. But my son was like, "Hey, you got to check out PewDiePie's latest video." Hmm. I was like, "What? Why would I? Why would I do that?" And I almost was like, "No, <laughs> I want to look at it." He's all, "No, no, no. He's drawing." I'd love so, to see what his, what his drawing followers. from life would look like. Yeah. 21 million followers? Hit on Instagram? Yeah. Yeah, and on, on YouTube, 111 million subscribers on YouTube. Awesome. Nice. So, uh, well, so yeah, I just thought, no, I just thought I'd share no, that. He has no body fat either. He's like super muscular <laughs> and handsome. <laughs> I'm super je jealous of this guy. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right, should we uh, should we wrap it up for today? 
Let's wrap. Can you send us out on a wrap? You haven't done that in a while. Oh, man. Uh, I'm not even going to try. I'm going to try. But oh. if I were, I would rap about PewDiePie. <laughs> wow. Just say the name like you're going to rap and then don't follow up. That's yeah. <laughs> well, PewDiePie rhymes to try. I'll do it before I die. die. Okay. I was trying to add it. Like the I'm sorry. At the end. Yeah, if... If you stuck with us this far, post the mic emoji in the uh, in the comments. <laughs> but actually, I do want to. We do want to hear your thoughts about the conversation today. Obviously, there's there's a, a nice uh, back and forth happening in the YouTube comments, and uh, and I just want to remind you guys about Self Publishing Pro. We have a free six day video series where we talk about the course. We give you some actionable things that you can do um, uh, starting right now to, to build out your self-publishing project. Um, and so you could sign up for that for free. And then the enrollment for the course is going to be um, February 27th through March th uh, 4th. And we'd love to get you to, to come on to that. And um, if you go to selfpublishingpro.com, you could sign up there. You could get more information about it there. So, so do check that out. And if you have any questions, just reach out to us or, or leave it in the comments, and we'll try to we'll try to get back to you guys. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by SVS Learn. We're becoming a great illustrator. Starts. Your hosts are Will Terry, Lee White, and I'm Jake Parker. Uh, special thanks to our podcast producer Daniel Two from. Uh, getting this thing edited and posted online. We appreciate him for for everything that he does. Uh, special thanks to our keeper of the curriculum, Austin Shirtliff, Shirtliff, our show notes wrangler, Lily Howell, and our chief operations officer, Lisa Fott. Now, go draw something. <laughs>